Hello and welcome everybody uh, coming to this uh, convo Friday at five organized by ICSL. Now this is your weekly destination on Fridays at 5 p.m. where we discuss the repercussions of the national education policy. Atul Nishal kicked it, uh, you know, kicked uh, the, the ball into the goal last week and set the ball rolling and served an ace. It continued for close to an hour and a half and several important points had come up for discussion. For once, this is not about Atul or me talking or Dr. Anuradha Rai talking, this is about you. Each one of you in your capacity as administrator, teacher, parent, student, someone who is impacted by this education policy, and actually all of us are, all of us are in some capacity or the other, this is our forum. This is our forum to lend it a critical constructive voice, and that voice will eventually become a think tank that will probably be represented to the Ministry of Education and will create a kind of consensus. So the questions that are doing the rounds, are the policies that have been laid out implementable? Is there a roadmap to such implementation? How long will we take to implement such things? Do the states need a clear charted out plan from the center? Today we are talking about foundational numeracy and uh, foundational literacy and numeracy. 25 crore school students, five crores, almost you know one, one fourth, one fifth of us we do not have basic literacy and numeracy skills. Can you imagine that? And the report predicts, or the policy document predicts, it can actually go up to 10 crores in the future. That is why it is being envisaged that one student will take care of the other. So one is to one to try and overcome this problem. Is there a way to overcome? What is the way to overcome? How important is this? What is the way forward for us? There are several important talk points. And I've got a very, very important panel here. Why have I sort of come in and jumped in here? I have jumped in here because Atul Nischal has a lot to talk about and is one of the best experts on the subject. So he can't just moderate. You've got to hear him lay it out for you in as much detail so that the discussion becomes that much more fruitful. So I will go to Atul to lay it out in a second. Dr. Anuradha Rai, principal of Ambion School, is another subject expert or a domain expert, someone I am looking forward to hearing. A lot of you are there who will make some important pertinent points. So here is our format. I've also got Anirban Aditya with me. I hope he has joined by now. He is an entrepreneur who runs a series of schools. He has, I'm told, runs a series of schools in Calcutta and is also a parent. So we will have varied perspectives on this convo over the next 55 odd minutes. So what am I supposed to do here? Let me introduce my little bit, which I think has not been addressed in the policy enough. In our country, we talk about foundational literacy. We talk about foundational numeracy, but we do not talk about physical literacy. Now, where am I coming from and what is this? This is where I'm coming from. Pulela Gopichand and me were having a conversation. And here's Gopi, and I'm paraphrasing or I'm quoting Gopi. In one of the camps in his academy in Hyderabad, a young girl between the age of seven and eight walked up to him and he, was, he had all these young students standing next to each other and he was taking a class. So this young girl, so Gopi was throwing a shuttle each like this, exactly like this, if you can see my hand movement at each of the girls and they, all they needed to do was catch like this and throw it back to him. So he did so for this young girl, and the girl dropped the shuttle. Gopi thought, okay, he, she may have dropped it. He picked it up and he threw it again, and she dropped it again. Gopi thought, okay, fair enough, let me move on, and he moved on. By the time the class ended 45 minutes later, this girl came up to Gopi and said, quote, sir, can you help me how to catch a shuttle? And if you go and speak to Gopi, he says the feet under his you know, uh, uh, the, the, the floor under his feet actually trembled. He realized in this country, we do not have physical literacy. How many of us have allowed our children to run free? How many of us have allowed them to throw balls in the air like we did, you and I, when we were youngsters? 
So I will add that into the mix along with foundational literacy and numeracy without further ado. And we will stick to time. So that's something please remember. And before I, I sort of move on, I've got to tell you one more housekeeping point. Anyone who wants to be part of this, and you should be, you should from next week, you know, anyone who is interested, please know that we will use the WISE app to build this community. Anyone who registers on the ICSL website will get a link, and I repeat, will get a link to download the app and join the Friday at 5 convo. This will be a one-time registration, which means you will not have to repeat it. And once registered, you will have access, resources that we will upload regularly and participate in all of the discussions. So WISE app, next Friday, link, subscribe to our website, get on there and be a part of all of what we are going to talk about. The next 10 minutes belong to Atul, then to Anuradha Rai, then to Anirban. And then I'll sum it up briefly and take all of you. So from 5.30 to 5.45 is your time. Plan your questions and comments based on what you hear and limit them to about two minutes each and we will take as many as possible. Over to you, Atul Mishra. Thank you, Boria. Thank you very much uh, for a very nice uh, kickoff to the second convo. And um, let me just, uh, due to the paucity of time, let me get straight to the point. I think a lot of us school educators are worried about implementation of the policy. Uh, and I do agree completely that every policy is as good as its implementation. And we have a history of failures for our skepticism, uh, for our doubt in whether or not the nation would actually see this policy being implemented. But from what we are hearing and from what we are seeing, the kind of initiatives that are being taken up by CBSE, by NCRT, by some other bodies, by the Ministry of Education, uh, I think the government is slightly serious about implementing this policy Okay. Uh, than previous times. And uh, I am very sure that in the next few months we will see action, uh, we will see a national curriculum framework coming out and then obviously we will see a curriculum coming out of that and we will start a lot of initiative teacher training through the government. Having said that, uh, I personally feel that the, the private school uh, body and, and most of us who have joined today on Friday at 5 are belonging to that community of private schools. I don't, do not think that we need to wait for the government to implement the policy. A policy is a national document. Uh, it's very good that the policy now recognizes a lot of um, innovative ideas in education. And we are free to implement those ideas because we are the school leaders. We want to lead our schools to success. There is a policy framework which we can use to benefit our students, benefit our teachers, benefit our schools, and benefit the community at large. So our focus should shift from worrying about whether or not it will be implemented by the government to how do we, how do we as schools implement it? And for that, let me hit out on four important points that are covered in the national education policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the foundational literacy and numeracy. And these four points will give us some sort of direction to our school leaders on what are the challenges or what are the things that they need to do. So if we look at Article 2.3, that's the first important article, the policy clearly mentions that the government is going to be aggressively recruiting and training teachers throughout the nation so that they can implement early childhood education as well as they are qualified to implement foundational literacy and numeracy focus in the students because we, we understand that we do not have enough teachers and all of us are concerned where would we get the teachers from 
to train that. Now, this has two implications on, uh, on the private schools. We all understand that a government job is really considered lucrative for a lot of uh, our folks in India. The moment the government starts aggressively hiring teachers in that particular segment, the private schools would start finding it challenging to get the right resources, the best resources. So I think somewhere the private schools, uh, I know throughout you know, India, if we look at some of, some of the schools, there have been stories of how the younger teachers, the PRTs are sometimes underpaid uh, and overworked. I think we will have to improve the work conditions of teachers in our schools to compete with the kind of um, uh, environment and the salaries that the government gives. Let me move quickly to my second point, which is far more important and have more implications. If you look at Article 2.4 of the policy, I, as a mathematician, am very happy that they have included the fact that we should develop mathematical thinking in our students. Now, this is an area which we have ignored for a, for a very long time. Unfortunately, subjects like mathematics have been also taught through the rote memorization process. So this is a great uh, aspect of the policy. What that means for us as schools is that we will have to train all our teachers to conduct activities among our students which allow them to think mathematically. And I think when I say thinking mathematically, how do we develop number sense in a child? How do we explain him the difference between 100 and 999 people? Uh, they are just not two, three digit numbers. Uh, and I think that kind of acumen, mathematical acumen needs to be developed right from the early years, from the foundational years, which, which are up to class two. The second very important aspect in that article is the introduction of formative, adaptive, continuous assessment for younger kids. Now, the very fact that the government is saying we need to individualize learning, we need to measure the progress of each child, not as a group, but we need to focus on individual learning, and that could happen only through adaptive testing. I think it's a great opportunity for us, the private schools, to bring in formative, adaptive, continuous assessment in our schools. For that, again, we will need to empower our teachers. And I think these two points would affect us not, we don't need to wait for the government to implement the policy. Just because the national policy says that, all the progressive uh, school leaders, and, and I'm assuming that if somebody, you know, if, if 200 people are joining us on a Friday evening, we are progressive school leaders, we are progressive educators. And I think we should take this cue from the policy and start looking at how do we really implement that in our school. And, and that is a very important point. The third aspect which will benefit a lot of budget private schools is that when you go to remote corners, you go to Kapurthala, you go to you know, smaller towns, uh, you see a lot of private budget schools struggling because the students who are coming in at grade one are really not prepared to be in grade one. Now that's a big problem because they don't have any, any education before that. And for that, in Article 2.5, the government clearly mentions that it's NCRT would be preparing a school preparation module, which will be a three month module. So any school which wishes to use that, now this is not mandatory folks, this is something that you can use if you would like to use. You can pick up that three month mandatory, uh, three month preparatory module that NCRT is developing and ask all the parents that look, your child is not ready for grade one, therefore, the child has to go through this three month exercise, which is again a very, very good initiative by the government. Uh, in the article 2.7, and I'm skipping, skipping some articles which are related to, uh, to the government because I think they're the best people to focus on midday meal 
midday meals, etc., because we don't need to worry about them. Uh, if you look at Article 2.7, again, for private schools like us, there is adequate opportunity. There's a whole new window opening up. For the first time, the government, any government policy has recognized the importance of peer learning, peer tutoring. And they're saying, look, we understand the teachers may not be ready to deal with this burden. So we are giving you two options. You can begin a peer learning, peer tutoring program in school. Now, we know Boria, like whenever, you know, we, we go to a university in America or England, all of them have a well-established peer tutoring programs where senior students would be helping freshmen, uh, sophomores to cope with their courses. I think something like that, all our schools need to start thinking about as to can they use grade 12 students who are doing exceptionally well to spend two hours a day with students who are struggling. And that, that kind of a program, now parents cannot, uh, you know, obstruct those programs because that is part of a national policy. So you can actually take advantage of the fact that the national policy is recommending that to educate the parents that, look, this is not, you know, an individual who feels like that. The government feels like that. The second important thing is that if I wanted to, to you know, if I uh, tomorrow wanted to volunteer my time in Anuradha school or Mr. Jain's school, you know, as a parent that I'm going to come and, and interact with students, a lot of school leaders would say, uh, we, well, you know, we, we, we really don't have a structure to do that. Uh, we don't know how it will happen. But again, the government says that you as a school can now recruit volunteers who would be willing to come into the school and spend time with kids. So I think these are some of the great opportunities that are opening up for our, for our schools. And we should be ready to take advantage of these opportunities. That's my submission, uh, Boria. Uh, Some very important points made. I've made my notes. Uh, that's what I was uh, doing. I will ask questions if need be, but I want you all to ask. And, and this is your forum. This is as interactive as it will probably get in the intellectual space in this country. I think ICSL is doing an absolutely wonderful job because there are no forums where Teachers, parents, uh, educators, leaders, thought leaders can reach out to people and interact in a manner that we are trying to do here. So hats off to I, uh, ICSL, to Atul, to Priya, and, and to the foundational board of ICSL. Uh, Dr. Anuradha Rai, I mean, someone I'm looking forward to hearing. Uh, Dr. Rai, uh, as, as a principal, as a leading educator, as a school leader, as somebody who will formatively shape careers going forward, have done that in the past with great distinction. Your thoughts on this very, very important subject of uh, foundational uh, numeracy and literacy and, you know, uh, the challenges that Atul just mentioned. So if you want to take some of his points also, do please take. Your time starts now. Uh, Ten minutes if possible because we want to take as many questions. Dr. Anuradha Rai. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Boria and uh, Atul. Uh, and good evening, everyone. It gives me great pleasure and a sense of hope that so many of us kindred spirits have gathered today here to discuss the new education policy and especially the theme on foundational literacy and numeracy. Uh, Atul has already shared the various articles. So I would like to stick to, uh, you know, very specifically literacy and numeracy and its importance and what is the way forward. Uh, here I would like to add, because one of the questions asked by the, one of the participants was that, you know, what about the earlier policies? So even though they highlighted the need for speaking, reading, writing and listening, there was not enough emphasis and it was not really spelt out in the education, uh, you know, uh, document, which is, uh, you know, in this case, it has been spelt out. Uh, so I will briefly discuss four areas. What exactly do we mean when we say literacy and numeracy? Uh, what, did we, what do we know about early literacy and numeracy as per research? And what kind of experiences do we need to provide as school leaders? And uh, what is our role as school leaders? I think Atul touched upon it briefly and I would like to take it a step further. 
So, uh, when we talk of literacy and numeracy, so literacy was uh, previously thought to comprise of skills of reading and writing. And children were deemed to be fit by the age of six to be able to read and write. But now, over the last past few decades, we, we have uh, realized that uh, literacy emerges gradually and begins with learning a language, which happens through looking at books in infancy itself. And according to the national literacy strategy, uh, uh, you know, the literacy is defined as the capacity to read, understand, <clears throat> sorry, and critically appreciate various forms of communication, which includes spoken language, printed text, <coughs> broadcast, and digital media. So if we look at this from this uh, lens, uh, literacy, uh, you know, what is central to literacy is search for meaning and understanding. It is not about letters. It is about communication. And, uh, you know, that language could be verbal and even non-verbal. Uh, another aspect to remember is that speaking, listening, reading, and writing develop concurrently and not sequentially. And uh, if we just uh, briefly, if I touch upon numeracy, uh, as, uh, you know, when we are talking about, like Atul explained, it is more about mathematical thinking. It is not about just uh, being able to add or subtract or multiply. It encompasses the ability to use the mathematical understanding to solve problems, meet the demands of everyday life, you know, uh, to be able to communicate quantitatively, make sense of data, uh, spatial awareness, and so on. So why, why are we talking about it and why is it important? So multiple studies have indicated that children who do not read or write and communicate effectively at primary uh, levels are more likely to struggle uh, in other areas uh, in later uh, you know, life, uh, be it uh, they could be unemployed, they, they could uh, suffer for poor emotional health and even lack of self-esteem. Uh, and uh, also it has been noticed that children who have a robust you know, vocabulary uh, you know, and uh, well-established uh, you know, system of demonstrating uh, you know, they you know, being able to talk, uh, you know, and explain things and, and understand narrative and stories uh, are identified as strong predictors of later, uh, you know, literary achievement. So therefore, in this light, uh, you know, we need, uh, so that is why it is so important to understand that uh, we need to build on these two uh, important skills. And I absolutely agree with Borea and uh, you know and it resonates with me what he talked about physical literacy that has to be uh, the third kind of uh, element uh, so th thinking of this and looking at it uh, from this uh, aspect so what kind of experiences as school leaders can we provide as as practice practitioners what can we provide to our children uh, so uh, even though language and literacy learning happens naturally through play and everyday exercises there are certain uh, skills which need to be uh, taught explicitly, say something like phonological awareness. In fact, one of the questions which was asked was that why are there learning gaps? The learning gaps are there because our teachers do not know, they are themselves not aware how to teach the phonological awareness. There is something called the alphabetic code. There's something called print knowledge. What is print knowledge? How a text is organized? Is it from left to right? Why do we read from top to bottom? And this starts right from when a child is a baby, when you're telling them a story, that is when it starts. And similarly, uh, when we talk about emergent writing, you know how uh, uh, when a small baby is drawing and you know they are putting marks on a paper and then when you ask them, what are you doing? And they will tell you a story around it. And maybe an adult when they subscribe it and then uh, talk back, it is a very empowering experience because it tells the child that this is how your, uh, you know, what you speak and what is written is connected. And that is at some stage then progresses into writing words, writing phrases, sentences, and so on. Uh, so coming to numeracy, uh, you know, again, it is present from a very, very early age in children. Uh, children understand that, you know, when you take away something, it becomes less from a group of things, when you add something, it becomes more. And uh, so what I would uh, definitely uh, suggest is that giving children opportunity to use numbers in context uh, through stories 
uh, you know, that have numbers, giving them material which has numbers like clocks and calendars and price lists and keyboard. And also asking them simple questions like, uh, are there enough chairs for everyone in the room? You know, so things like this will help children to, you know, uh, understand and, you know, get on the path of the mathematical thinking, looking for patterns everywhere, be it clothes, be it uh, curtain styles, uh, you know, in nature, all flowers and vegetables and everywhere else you can find uh, patterns, spatial awareness, you know, shapes, how are they made, uh, changing the shape, stretching it, uh, you know, using number line, uh, using manipulatives, uh, making math, uh, basically making math more visible so that, uh, you know, children do not kind of think of math as a subject because math is a life skill. Math is everywhere. So the moment children start understanding this, uh, you know, it, our task is done. So this is what we need to kind of look at as educators that are our children enjoying and, you know, uh, understanding what they are learning. So uh, what are the implications for school heads? As uh, Atul rightly said, uh, the national education policy is a vision document. Of course, NCRT will now create a curriculum framework and along with grade level expectations and uh, subject wise expectations, expectations are where, where is a child uh, supposed to be? Say, suppose a one year old, uh, sorry, grade one child should be able to read those many words, uh, you know, be able to do this and that. So, you know, it's kind of spelled out. And, uh, you know, uh, it, um, uh, you know, it would, uh, of course, it would require a lot of, uh, you know, content, uh, which he talked about to translate the uh, vision. However, the need of the R is for us to understand the policy in not only letter, but spirit and start planning, as he rightly said, because this cannot happen overnight. We need to know and understand what is it that needs to be done? Why do we need to go do it? And how will we do it? And how will we know? Have we, you know, kind of achieved it or not? Of course, the guidelines will come. But as school leaders, uh, we need to prepare ourselves to lead the process. And uh, by first, we ourselves have to understand and also ensure that our teachers are trained by arranging for seminars and, you know, uh, by arranging uh, training for them. And apart from this, we also need to restructure not just our own curriculum, uh, but, the plan, but plan our resources and assessments, I think Atul touched upon it uh, briefly. And uh, this, in, in, in fact, in turn will also inform our curriculum and the pedagogical approach. Uh, then, uh, up, up, uh, see, Article 2.7, I think, talks about recruiting volunteers to help build early literacy and numeracy. And uh, uh, Atul gave an example, and I completely agree with it because we can use uh, our senior students and we can also use our parent pool. And I have done it very successfully with excellent results. Uh, another good idea would be to assess our children's background and developmental stage and plan the instruction suitable for them, keeping in mind the guidelines. So, of course, NCRT is coming uh, up with a bridge course, but I'm sure as school leaders, we can just go ahead and start doing it. And then, you know, uh, so we save that much of time. Since we know that high quality literacy and numeracy experiences in the early years can have beneficial impact on children's later achievements, we need to take a lead in ensuring that not only do they have a robust training uh, for the their own staff, but also collaborate with other school leaders and build a community of practitioners that can help and support one another. Well, will it be easy in a country as diverse and vast as India? No one said it would be. We need to look for like-minded partners, NGOs, that can come together to make it happen. For example, not for profits like ICSL, Echo India, Pratham, Kevalya, foundation to just name a few can collaborate and support the government in this task and in our personal capacities as school leaders if each of us decides to help by not only ensuring that their own school system is supported uh, and but also is willing to support others the task will be easy thank you sorry Borya did I cross the limit <laughs> You were spot on. You were absolutely 11 minutes gone. This is excellent. Lots have been put on the table already for us to chew on. 
uh, please formulate your questions once again. I mean, if Priya, if you are there, if you could moderate the questions, Atul can actually see everyone. So you can ask uh, some of the people to see. I've seen participants from Chennai. I could see participants from Delhi schools. I could see participants from Gujarat. So there are, there are people from across the country. So this is what the whole purpose of ICSL is. Before I, I go uh, to the others, and as I said, I will take as many. Onirban, can you give me two perspectives? One, that of a parent and as an entrepreneur who runs schools, you have several thousand students for who you have responsibility. Can you articulate your thoughts on this subject before I take this forward? Onirban. Yeah. Hi, Boria. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> The thing, first of all, I should consider myself as a parent because the topic that we're all discussing about, because I'm also a parent, I, I, I should first revert myself as a parent. So what I think is important right now is uh, if I talk about the subject math, the fear is something which needs to be not there in the students. And this can be done in a lot of ways. I always ask my principal, my teachers that you know the technicals, you are academicians. You have to put things in place and how can we do it academically? The thing is that if we talk about the subject mathematics, you see most of the students, they fear mathematics. This has to go. If the fear in this subject is there, we need to understand that math is not a subject anymore. It's a need. Whether you are an employer, whether you are an employee, you have to consider math as a, as a part and parcel of your life. If you have to manage your finances as an employee or an employee, you need mathematics. You need to know the numbers, whatever you do. The numbers is very important. And if I, Boya, if I give you an example, like when we go in the UK, those pound shops, you know, all the products, they, they cost just a pound each. When we pay to the cashier five pounds, he needs to check that he has to give me four pounds back. So everywhere, they, the technology has to be used in the right way. That's very important because, you know, the students, today's generation, they are smarter than us. They know how to do things easier, quicker, and faster. If they see that technology is a replacement for my mind, uh, for, for, for brainstorming or for my mind, they will always try to apply those technologies. So technology has to be applied in the right way, which is very important. Unless since as a child, if we don't uh, uh, try to uh, set aside the mobile phones, the computers, the calculators, it's very difficult to get mathematics into their brains because always they will opt for the shortcuts. I think we have to start thinking from that level as a parent, again, why I'm saying so, because teachers are there in the school for a certain number of hours. And when we are talking about the age group, that age group needs a lot of attention from the parents. Even the parents also fear a lot. That fear psychosis has to go out. What I see in an English medium school, when we see the students, they can speak in English when, we, when they go to the, uh, when, when they go, uh, to the house, they, they think their parents are unable to talk to them in English and they feel that their parents doesn't know, they have never studied, uh, never studied. So this, the stigma, the stigma has to go out. That is the most important thing, I, I believe. Other, otherwise, this, uh, this, the kids, they start feeling that they are superior than their parents. This parent starts feeling that, my, what needs to know English? But when this government has allowed us that language is not a barrier. Again, as I told you about mathematics, at the same time, Borea, if you see, if one cannot speak in English, we, we start stigmatizing them. So this is something which has to go out. If you can't speak in English, that doesn't mean we have to stigmatize it. There are so many ways to make one understand. Whichever language I'm comfortable with, that the way of understanding or explanation is the most important thing, what I think, Borea. Yeah, so uh, that, that I, what, in general, that's all that I wanted to say. And as an owner uh, of a school, I always try to tell my teachers, the principal, that we have to think things out of the box. That is very important. If we cannot think things about things out of the box and how to, the comfort level is very important. The shyness has to go out. The fear psychosis has to go out and the stigma that has to go out. That's very important. And training the teachers, training the parents more than the teachers. I think it, ha it has to be hand on hand. Otherwise we cannot come to a solution and try to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so Onirban is talking about stigma. And he's basically saying whether it is English, whether it is math, whether it is English, is English the most important aspect of class discrimination in this country? Because I'm able to speak and communicate in English 
there is a sense of superiority ingrained into me. Uh, Dr. Rai talked about math as a skill set rather than a subject and making it more interesting and informative and entertaining and fun. I mean, bringing that element into learning. Extremely important points. Atul mentioned four or five important points. So this is, is, is our bucket list so far. We've got serious amounts of time. So open to questions. Atul, why don't you take over now? and uh, sort of get some of the questions because you are able to see them better as host. And uh, just whoever is asking your question or comment, stick to two minutes, please, allowing as many questions as possible. Atul, over to you. Uh, thank you, Buria. So we have um, a question from uh, Pooja Bose. Is she there? So we can, we can unmute. Pooja, just one second. I think we'll need to... Yeah. Okay, Pooja, go ahead. I think Pooja is muted. Pooja, if you can unmute yourself, please. Atul, if we can go to the next person and then we can get Pooja back. Okay, Ruchi Rai has a question. Can we unmute Ruchi Rai, please? Good evening, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, sir, I just want to know one thing. Like, what do we literally mean by this foundational literacy and numeracy? Because many people are perceiving it in this form that it is only related with maths and language. But it has been also observed that there is something like nature literacy. When Ma'am was giving some examples, like you can use nature in mathematics. So are we leaving EVS completely or we are still looking forward to include that thing in some form for the juniors? Okay. Dr. Rai, why don't you take that? Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, lovely question. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, EVS is a very integral part, and let's kind of uh, you know not put subjects in uh, you know kind of boxes. It is kind of let's uh, uh, you know adapt the interdisciplinary approach. So of course, what is EVS? It is environmental science. So why why won't we include it in everything that we are teaching? So uh, uh, you're absolutely right that, you know, we will be, you know, so nature is a very, very important part and using natural resources to teach uh, children would be an excellent uh, practice, be it math, you know, you can use pebbles, you can say, use twigs, you can, and we do that all the time. So yes, absolutely. And then from there, you can take it to, you know, uh, whatever you had the inquiry that you wanted to start. So yes, absolutely right. Okay, uh, there's a question from Anita Sharma. Anita, if you are there, can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Anita Sharma. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi, my question is to Dr. Atul because he is, I know he's a person of mathematics. So Atul, uh, we had a discussion also. I just want to understand that when we are talking about uh, uh, inculcating mathematical thinking. Uh, first of all, I feel that it should be different at different levels. The meaning of mathematical thinking will change. How it is going to impact the learning of other subjects? Because it is not only about mathematics, what I feel. Okay. So that's a, that's a, a very good question, Anita ji. And uh, since we are also from mathematics, it's, it's a great, uh, you know, question from a mathematician to a mathematician. Uh, so there are certain, uh, we need to understand the structure of mathematical thinking first. Uh, there are certain, when we say mathematical thinking, there are certain skills. For example, there is a estimation is a skill. So estimation is a mathematical skill. Proportional thinking is a mathematical skill. A proportional thinking is something that you would use in, um, in recipes a lot. So whenever you download a recipe, uh, the recipe actually gives you a recipe of four servings or three servings. 
and you have to make food for 20 people. So you have to figure out how proportionally you will change each of the ingredients. Now that is something we call proportional thinking. Some people can do it easily. Some people may not be able to do it. Easily. When we talk about estimation, now that's a very simple skill um, that can be developed. Estimating the number of uh, leaves on a plant. Uh, if we ask a child to estimate how many leaves are there on the plant, and then once the estimated thing is done, then they can actually count it. So first of all, mathematical thinking is not restricted to mathematics alone. Uh, mathematics in itself is not restricted to mathematics. Uh, if you're teaching EVS, whether it's history, whether it's uh, geography, whether it's civics, whether it's any other subject, biology, uh, physics, chemistry, uh, languages, uh, there is certain amount of analytical mathematical thinking that can help you understand the subject better. I am not too sure how it will interrupt or, or it will um, affect the study of other subjects. I personally feel the any impact of mathematical thinking uh, in learning other subjects would be a positive impact and definitely not a negative impact. They will be able to understand what they're studying and they will be actually able to do a better job if they can require, I mean, sports, for example. I'm pretty sure, I mean, Boria would be the right person to say, uh, but sports people who have mathematical ability to figure out uh, what the scoreboard is actually saying so uh, and interpret it and convert that into the strategy for the next 10 overs. Now that requires mathematical thinking. You're taking some numbers. You have some hours uh, overs remaining. You have a playing time remaining and you need to cre recreate that into a strategy. So I personally feel mathematical thinking will help schools help uh, all of us to impart a better understanding of mathematics and other subjects too. And it will also tackle the problem of math phobia that, that Anirban ji mentioned. Uh, one of the reasons why we are scared of maths is because it is uh, pushed down our throat like facts, figures, formulas. We need to stop all that stuff. I, I really feel, I think we need the purpose of learning mathematics is really not to memorize trigonometric formulas. Nobody's going to ask you those formulas later on. But if you can develop the acumen of thinking mathematically, it's going to help you. I hope that's not a long answer, Anita. Three questions I will take. One from uh, Pooja. I'm told by Priya that Pooja is back. Uh, Pooja, if you can unmute, then to Pinky, then to Ruchika. Pooja, if you're back. Good evening, Pooja? everyone. Yeah, please. Yes, yeah. Good evening. Uh, my first question is about metacognition. So all of these two important facets of learning, numeracy and literacy, comes down, boils down to the fact that metacognition has to begin at an early age. But when should we actually start teaching that to the children? The second point is that learning to learn is extremely important. I always uh, share this with my teachers also, that please do not solve a problem, a mathematical problem with your students. Teach them how to solve that problem because that is what your role as a teacher is. So I think uh, we miss the point essentially as educators at this level that we don't teach our students how to solve or how to comprehend a language. So I just wanted to understand your views on that, that when should we start with the method process and how do we inculcate the habit of teaching the teachers to teach the children how to learn? Excellent question. Excellent question because you are laying emphasis on what I call the process because, and I keep saying this to everyone, I encountered that in India, we learn how to give examinations as students, we don't learn subjects. In Oxford, the day I first went, I did not know how to, sort of footnote uh, despite topping the Calcutta University and, and, and creating multiple records. I knew how to score marks. I knew how to break records. I did not know history. Fantastic question. 
So, Dr. Rai and Atul, uh, either of you. Dr. Rai, why don't you have a crack on this? So, I'll, can I, can I take okay, the go first go. one yeah. and then Anuradha, you can pick up the second one slightly. So, uh, Pooja, excellent question. First of all, I, I think uh, I agree with Boria that, I mean, fabulous question because metacognition is the root of, uh, if we are aware. So, for those of you who might not be aware of the term, metacognition basically means that we are aware of our thinking process. Um, and we, because we are aware of our thinking process, uh, therefore, we can be better learners um, because we are more aware. So that's all metacognition means primarily. Now, typically, uh, the research pointed out that metacognition as a process starts um, when a child is seven years to nine years and maybe 10 years, depending upon the child. However, there is a very good research that came out in 2009 where they saw evidence of metacognition um, development in preschoolers. Okay, so this is the first time it was a breathtaking research and I can share with you the details of the paper that came out um, um, because I'll have to access that paper. I don't have it with me right now. Um, I think it was by a person called Simon that I'll have to check that. And, and they that metacognition can actually start in preschoolers also. However, even to begin that process, they need to be put in the right learning environment. Now, I, I echo, uh, you know, the sentiments of uh, Dr. Majumdar, because I can tell you when, when I started learning to learn mathematics. So I started to learning to learn mathematics when I went to the US to do my PhD. Unfortunately, in our system, in our entire thing, you know, we might talk about the fact that we want students to learn how to learn, but we do not give them the opportunities to learn how to learn. I got those opportunities because I was lucky, so maybe I developed a better understanding of mathematics because I was in a different environment. So I don't think we should worry about uh, at what stage in their life they will be able to do that. I think what we should worry about is what are the kind of learning experiences we need to deliver to our students so that they can learn so that their abilities of metacognition start developing. Uh, that's what my viewpoint is. Puja, I hope I've answered your question. I'll shift the other question to Anuradha. Yeah. I quite agree with Atul and uh, you know it can start as early as uh, you would like for example when you are uh, you know when they are doing something you can ask oh how did you do that or what were you thinking when you were doing or or you know when we read books to them we kind of uh, you know uh, show them the title and ask them about it and you know ask them to predict ask them to make connections so all this or you know, when I'm uh, kind of modeling for my children, I'm saying, well, I wanted to say this, so this is how I would do it. So suppose I were to write a piece of, uh, uh, you know, writing, and I would say that, okay, the first thing, what do I need to do? So I'm actually thinking aloud the process, and I'm modeling it for my children. So when we do it, children understand that this is what we are uh, supposed to do you know some of them will do it intuitively and some of them will kind of learn so that is one thing it was a very pertinent question and again uh, you know uh, it all depends so uh, of course you have to give opportunity to children to discover to you know do projects and learn to learn and there is there are no two views about it that rather than uh, you know emphasizing on uh, you know facts and uh, rote learning we need to teach them to fish isn't it that is what we uh, that is the ultimate aim uh, and I completely, completely agree with you that uh, we need to teach and that is what I think uh, uh, your uh, endeavor is right now. Okay. I, I saw two more hands going up there. Uh, let me just quickly see. Two more hands, yes, Pinky and Lakshmi and uh, there was one more as well. So let's quickly take your questions. Pinky, quickly, you you first. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Myself, Pinky Gupta from Delhi, Maxwood School, Rohini. Sir, I am teaching computer programming, right? 
and so you already know that there is a strong relationship between mathematics and computer programming now at the age uh, when the student is studying in class 11th and 12th and they have to make the programs related to find out the prime numbers and even numbers so some of these students are finding it difficult what actually is the base of finding the prime numbers so how can you deal with such kind of students at that moment in the in the age uh, in the uh, in the grade 11th and 12th atul okay pretty i i think if they, if they really have not understood theory of prime numbers uh, they will definitely struggle in writing a, a algorithm to find uh, prime numbers um, so if you do not have a very sound knowledge of of mathematics uh, if you don't understand the concepts and i think that is where any any p try is trying to push us into what you have said is exactly the kind of problems that we as educators are feeling that our our school students graduate into the real world but they cannot really apply what they are supposed to have been learned in the school uh god knows uh, i i don't have an answer to this question um i think they need to they need to really understand go back to number theory and try to understand prime numbers before they can create a algorithm for that that's what i feel like okay okay uh, two more questions uh, can i go to ruchika now ruchika and lakshmi ruchika first you ruchika if you are there you are not okay lakshmi can i go to you please yes um yeah. uh, my question uh, fact not a question i have a uh, uh, you know um um Um, something to share with Anuradha, ma'am. Uh, Anuradha, ma'am. Good evening, my I'm Lakshmi. We have uh, spoken uh, before in ICSL webinars. We have uh, communicated before on this platform, uh, ma'am. Uh, this is with regard to uh, the need uh, for the teachers to uh, inculcate um, uh, love for math, to learn the math, to enjoy the subject. Uh, you know, and uh, in order to eliminate the fear in the ch uh, child's mind. i feel uh, if we have to inculcate my math as a life skill in uh, in the students in the foundational uh, stage i think there is a, a huge need to train our existing teachers uh, not only to cater to wide range of students coming from different uh, backgrounds but also to uh, you know uh, train but also the need arises to train these existing teachers to uh, you know inculcate a love for the subject so that it can be applied in the daily life and uh, Uh, the uh, the benefit can go to different kinds of uh, students do you feel the need uh, for that ma'am i just wanted your, uh, your opinion yes. on that yes thank you lakshmi i completely agree with you and uh, you know it's the teacher who's going to make the difference and uh, uh, you know we need to train our teachers and mentor them until they can see the wonder themselves and you know enjoy doing it they will not be able to infuse the same enthusiasm in their children so uh, you know the training has to be really well thought out and planned so that our teachers are excited and uh, you know they just go back as if like you know uh, discovering you know how it is done and uh, you know their sense of inquiry and only then will we be able to uh, do the same and second thing is i would uh, you know like to say that uh, making math more visual you know so rather than teaching it in an abstract way the language that we use in math so typically we say two twos are two fours are it means nothing so you know being careful of the language that you use so four times two or two times four so that is what we need to <coughs> uh, focus on hello can you hear me I, your video has gone, uh, Doctor Rai. Can you yeah, get your video yeah. back? Yeah, I'm trying. I think there was a call. I'm just trying. Uh, Doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, you're back. Yeah, yeah, you're okay. back. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say, Lakshmi. That was a, a very good question, and I agree with you completely. Okay. Two more questions. Uh, who were the two hands? Let me quickly go to them. Uh, there's Kajal and there's Deepshika. Kajal, quickly to you. Kajal, if you're there, can you unmute yourself, Kajal? Yeah, yeah. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Good evening, one and all. A quick question. Like in uh, the NEP, it it mentions that 
the in, uh, inclusion of mother tongue it will help uh, getting lot of literacy you know fluency but the question is like how to include mother tongue if we have students in the class who have some are tamil some are marathi and some are speaking in hindi so it becomes very difficult to include mother tongue in that case so how are we going to deal with different students who you know uh, speak in different languages and then teach english so integrating uh, integrating mother tongue is not a mandatory requirement kajal uh, the the policy clearly says wherever possible uh, and uh, and that's where we need to stick to so you don't have to start teaching in mother tongue if suppose you have a multilingual class okay okay dipshika can we get your question please Uh, yeah good evening everyone uh, my yeah. question is also somewhat similar sir i just wanted to ask that inclusion of mother tongue uh, till class 5 at this scenario when the globalization is there is it an appropriate step taken by the government because uh, so it is said that only a young mind can learn if i'm not wrong till 16 languages so aren't we depriving our children from learning uh, the other languages so first of all the government does not say that you need to stop teaching any other language uh, second um, there there are lot of uh, countries in the world for example i know china has been teaching for a very long time its entire education has been in chinese uh, yes i i don't know if they are an un, uh, advantaged society today as compared to us uh, japanese primary school in, uh, instruction has been in japanese for a very long time finland uh most of the uh, education is in finnish uh or or uh, or swami uh, their native language so i do not think that the progress uh, of the entire nation because if that theory was correct then japanese people should have been taught in english chinese people should have been taught in english uh you know uh, finnish people should have been taught in english um so i think that is our apprehension towards a change we are always apprehensive when when things need to change because it demands us to also move out of our comfort zone uh, and and uh, therefore some apprehensions do come in our mind parantu main aapko bata deta hu ki jitna maza apni bhasha mein seekhne ka aata hai wo shayad kisi aur bhasha mein nahi aata hai aur aaj ki tareekh mein bhi jab aap raat ko sote hain aur sapne dekhte hain aapko kabhi bhi sapna angrezi mein nahi aayega aapko kabhi bhi sapna german mein nahi aayega आपको वो सपना हिंदी में ही आएगा पता नहीं क्यों तो मेरे ख्याल से भगवान भी आपको रोज रात को बताता है कि भाई साहब क्यों भूलते जा रहे हैं अपनी भाषा को आ, और उस भाषा को मैं आपको बता रहा हूं मेरे को कई बार शर्म आती थी जब मैं अमेरिका से वापस आया तो मेरी हिंदी इतनी गंदी हो चुकी थी इतनी आ, आ, गंदी का मुझे प्रायवाच नहीं पता लेकिन वो इतनी आ, शर्म आती थी मेरे को लेकिन जब मैं उत्तराखंड में काम करने गया एक गवर्नमेंट के साथ और वहां पर मैंने एक आई ऑफिसर को देखा और वो आई ऑफिसर साउथ इंडिया से था ठीक है और साउथ इंडिया से होने के बाद उसने मेरे सामने अपने सेक्रेटरी को एक एक शुद्ध हिंदी के अंदर एक चिट्ठी डिक्टेट करी मुझे डिक्टेट की हिंदी आज भी नहीं आती और उसने वो पूरी शुद्ध हिंदी के अंदर और उसने एक बार भी उसके अंदर इंटरप्ट नहीं किया मैं उस साउथ इंडियन आई ऑफिसर से इतना ज्यादा इम्प्रेस हो गया कि मैं प्रभावित हो गया प्रभावित हुआ कि मैंने सोचा जितना ज्यादा हो सके मैं हिंदी का सो प्लीज वी डोंट हैव टू अडेप्ट इंग्लिश सोसाइटी वॉन्ट्स एस टू अडेप्ट आई थिंक एवरी लैंग्वेज इज ब्यूटिफुल वी नीड टू रिस्पेक्ट दैट एंड ऑल आर चिल्ड्रेन शुड नो हिंदी बिकॉज कभी तो वो हमारे संस्कार हम ये बोलते रहते हैं कि वो हमारे संस्कारों से हटते जा रहे हैं वो संस्कारों से इसलिए भी हटते जा रहे हैं वो हमारी जो संस्कार की थी तो जो पुस्तकें थी जो लिटरेचर था वो अब इंग्लिश में पढ़ रहे हैं सो आई थिंक वी नीड टू यू नो रिस्पेक्ट दैट पेरोगेटिव स्लाइटली एंड ओवर द ट्वेंटी ओवर द नेक्स्ट ट्वेंटी थर्टी ईयर्स वी विल सी अ डीप इम्पैक्ट इन आर सोसाइटी Uh, and again i'll come to the point still the government is giving an option like for example kendriya vidyalayas 
have already taken a stand that they will not be teaching uh, their medium of instruction will not be Hindi or a regional language. It will be English because that's how Kendri Vidyalayas are structured. Okay. So what do you you know, uh, our time is up and I think we have been able to take all the questions. Mira Hindi to itna acha hai so I will not even venture down Atul's route. Uh, uh, all I will say is the one hour, the one hour has flown past. And that is the whole point of a convo. Multiple voices, multiple opinions, multiple thought leaders coming into one platform to try and shape a better India, a better student, a better future, a better school curriculum, a better education policy, and reach out to all stakeholders who are all part of this. Because our aim is the same, a better country, a better education system, a better grooming for our children. That is the purpose. None of us are political here. ICSL is not a political platform. Here, whatever political color leanings we might have, we are coming here as educators, teachers, students, parents. That is what makes this platform so very alluring for me. Remember the Y, you know, the Wise app. Uh, uh, get onto that. Register on our website. You will be sent the link, and that is the only time you will need to register. Let us build this community. For all I will say is this dialogue is going to benefit India. And if that happens on the eve of Independence Day, what can make us more happy? This is a very different Independence Day. An Independence Day when unity is far more the need of the hour than ever before. And, and we've got to do that at multiple platforms, whether it is health, whether it is safety, whether it is education, whether it is protocol. So on that count, all I will say is thank you very, very much to everybody who participated. Thank you to ICSL for giving me this opportunity to be able to host this. To Atul Nischal, to Dr. Rai, to Anirban for putting their things out in, 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 in lucid and time effective manner. To all my people, who all my colleagues and friends who asked questions. To Priya who does the background work without uh, you know, coming to the forefront. To everyone. You, each of you are stakeholders of ICSL. On that count, it is a fabulous community and I'm proud of this community. Next week, same time, same place, Friday at 5, Wise app, remember, register on our website. Happy Independence Day, safe Independence Day, and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much.